Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. That's pretty good. Can we do it again? Good morning. Good morning. Now I know everybody's awake. Well, it's a special day here at Barry's Grove. It's our pastor's 25th anniversary celebration. All right. And I got to do this first. Eric, would you come up here and open your jacket up? We got to show you this. We, we got to see this right here. Y'all take a look at that. Robert. Let's scattered throughout the building. You'll see more of that later. We're going to have a bonfire after the service. <laughs> and we're going to put them one in a frame and put it on the wall like that. <laughs> Not going to do that? Okay. Well, all I can say is I'm sure glad that Carolina won a baseball game last night. <laughs> because you would have had a dilemma this afternoon with a 3 o'clock start. <laughs> it been tough. You'd had a big decision to make. Yeah. I had to bail. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> okay. Well, thank goodness the Lord worked all that out for us to have a great day today. So please stand and join us with who you say I am. with a good old hymn, He Keeps Me Singing.
Heavenly Father, Lord, we just, God, thank you that we can be in your house today. Thank you for um, the celebration we get to have for Craig Vincent this morning and for his faithfulness and his commitment to Berries Grove, to your church, to your people, God. And so we just, uh, we celebrate that today and we thank you. We celebrate you and worship you today. And Lord, I pray that as we uh, collect our tithes and offerings, God, that you'll just bless it, um, that you'll just... Speak to us, help us to give generously, God, to your work. And Lord, that I pray that you will um, just bless Barry's Grove to continue the work that you have for us in this community, that, uh, that, that these gifts will be used for that purpose. It's in your son's name I pray. Amen. Good morning. good morning. It's good to see you all here today. I want to welcome you to Berries Grove Baptist Church. We want to especially welcome our guests who are here today. Uh, some of you, I know, came for me, and I appreciate that. Uh, some of you haven't been here in a long time and, and uh, have come back, and it's just good to see you again. And uh, what a wonderful opportunity to fellowship and celebrate God's faithfulness today. And so I hope that's what we're going to do. If you're, a, if you're a first-time guest and you've never been here before, there are some welcome packets. I hope you got one. And uh, it tells you a little bit about us. There's a card in there you can fill out and drop in the offering plate on your way out. Tell us a little bit about yourself. But we're glad that you're here, thankful for you, and uh, I'd like to open us up with a word of prayer. Father, you are good, and you do good. Thank you for how you work in our lives, oftentimes in imperceptible ways, to bring us to moments like these. And Lord, in these moments, we are reminded of your faithfulness. Great is your faithfulness, O oh Lord. 
and we thank you today. Lord, as we worship you, <clears throat> we pray that you would help us to remember who gets the glory. As the song that was just played says, to God be the glory for the great things he has done. Lord, we glorify you today because you are worthy of all honor and praise and worship and glory and all those many other things that you deserve accolades for. And Lord, we just pray that as we celebrate your goodness today, Lord, that our lives would be impacted by your spirit. Lord, that you would transform us into the image of your son. Lord, that we might seek to love and obey you even as he obeyed you, his father. So, Lord, we offer the service up to you, and we pray that you would be glorified in it. In Jesus' name, amen. So this is probably one of the maybe only time or rare times that Craig did not have control of the service. <laughs> he had to come and ask me when he was supposed to come up. So anyway, this time is usually our prayer focus time, but uh, we renamed it today as a Craig focus time. <laughs> and um, part of the reason for that is that our social committee doesn't get to see these things normally because we do it at the end of the service. So they requested we do it earlier. So that's what we're going to do today. So I want to start by saying that uh, this celebration is not your swan song. <laughs> it's not a farewell gathering. It's a celebration of a very significant milestone in your ministry here with this body of believers. And so I don't want you to think we're ushering you out, okay? <laughs> don't get the wrong idea here. Uh, so, you know, you ever think about laying in bed at night and you think about something that you want to say about a situation on occasion that sounds really cool? You say, man, I've got it. It sounds really good. But, man, you just don't want to get up and write it down, you know? And you say, but it's so good, I'll remember it in the morning. Doesn't work that way, does it? <laughs> I had something really good. And I said, man, this is going to be nice. It's going to be really cool. And I got up the next morning. I couldn't remember none of it. <laughs> so I had to come up with something else. So I decided to title this Simply the Best. So I know you're familiar with, maybe you are, and others are a secular song by Tina Turner called Simply the Best. Yeah. We, you would hear it played after a lot of uh, championship ball games where our team would win a title of some sort. I haven't heard it in a long time, but I've heard that play quite a bit. Uh, and then uh, maybe you can remember, so if you're golfers, uh, a, a chip that Tiger Woods made at the Masters. Says, uh, uh, the announcer was saying, better than most, better than most, better than most. What I would say, that's not for Craig. He, he is simply the best. Not better than most, but simply the best. So uh, <clears throat> I'd also like to say that we like to think the best is still yet to come, too. You know, we're not, like, like I said, it's not your swan song. We've got many more years of service, we hope. So no pressure. No pressure. No pressure. Uh, as we reflect on how we got here, and uh, I'd like to, like to tell you when we got started. And it started on April the 25th, 1999, when Craig was called to be pastor here at Bears Grove. So God had already put in place the right man at the right time for the right job. And I'm sure you would all agree. For shepherding the flock here at Barry's Grove, I know it was your first church, and I'm sure that you had maybe reservations. <laughs> uh, but God knew what he was doing and what a success story it has been. 25 years of growing and maturing together with this church body, there have been so many lives that you have touched and blessed here in this fellowship. You preach the word of God faithfully each and every opportunity you've had. And oh my goodness, how you have visited your congregation in births, deaths, sickness, hospital stays, surgeries, shut-ins, you name it. 
you've been there. And we thank you for that. Uh, there have been numerous funerals that you have uh, walked the families through. And then your most favorite thing are weddings, I know. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <clears throat> Before a pastor have a successful ministry, his family must come alongside him and be a support to him. You've been truly blessed to have Tanya and Caroline in your life. And we want to thank you, Tanya and Caroline, for your support, for sharing your husband, uh, Tanya and Caroline, your father, to us. So I'd like to give them a round of applause. <laughs> uh, you may notice that uh, as a token of our appreciation, they're wearing flowers uh, that uh, they will display proudly, I'm sure, as you will see them later on throughout the festivities today. And uh, I want to thank you again for that. So Craig, words are not enough to express to you our love and appreciation for all you've done and what is to come as we continue to walk this road of ministry together. So I'd like, I'd like you to come up. And I'd like to present you. This is a monetary gift, and it was a love offering that was taken up by our, through our, by our folks here at Fellowship uh, for vacation or to use it to see you, whatever, however you see fit to use it. I've already figured it out. I'm sure you have a new golf club. No, no. <laughs> Go, going to Montana and Phoenix to see family in Montana and uh, Morgan Roberts, former missionary in Phoenix. All right. Well, we love you, brother. I love you, too. I'm bringing my Bible. Y'all really didn't think I wasn't going to preach. <laughs> I want to say thank you to some folks. Uh, first of all, <clears throat> thank you, Berries Grove, because uh, you have blessed me more than I've blessed you. And, uh, you know, I go back. I mean, we started going here. <laughs> well, quite frankly, we started going here before I was following the Lord and before my wife was saved in August of 94. And... Um, Man, you watched us grow up, get married, go to seminary, become a deacon, um, and, and you have walked through all that with us to this point today. And for that, I am so grateful. Um, but as somebody has said before, how have you made it so long? The key to longevity is not letting them figure out how to get rid of you. So <laughs> here I am. Here I am. Uh, and I will say in the early days, no, this was not my choice. I wanted to be a missionary. And plus, when I started, this church wasn't exactly in a great spot. Um, and, uh, you know, we had just gone through a difficult time. And, uh, and Brother Danny Glover's here today, and I'm thankful for him. He was, um, he was our interim at the time. And I spent a lot of time with him because he was my supervisor from a supervised ministry class. And I'll never forget, we went to breakfast once a week and talked about what ministry assignments I was supposed to be doing. And he said, he said, uh, Craig, I, I, I got something I need to ask you. And, uh, and I, you know, I'd really like to get your blessing on this. I'm like, okay, what? He said, I feel like the Lord is leading me to give your resume to the search committee at Barry's Grove. And I went, oh, no, no. <laughs> So, no, no, I'm going to be a missionary, and that church is a mess right now. No, no, sir. And he said, well, I understand that. He said, uh, I'm probably going to do it anyway, but I really would like your blessing. <laughs> and uh, I'll never forget, I said, brother, if everybody on that search committee agrees they want to talk to me, I'll take it as a sign from the Lord because I don't think they could agree on anything. And, <laughs> and they did. And here we are, 25 years later. So, thank you, Danny. Thank you. Thank you. Um, there's a few other people I want to thank. Um, uh, you know, I want to thank Ben, our associational mission strategist. Uh, but he's been a longer time friend of mine in the ministry. And I'm thankful not only to you, but to all of our Beulah Baptist Association pastors. We have, we have a really good fellowship that I think gives us an advantage over a lot of other pastors. Um, and then there's that, that man with the big beard over there in the corner, uh, Tim Bowes, 
who has been a dear brother to me uh, for ever since, ever since he came on staff here back in the year 2000. And we reluctantly let him go in 2005, but um, he's a good brother and has uh, helped me a lot over the years. Um, certainly, uh, I want to thank our staff. Uh, Lynn Brown is the greatest secretary in the history of secretaries. And my life would be much less <laughs> without her. Um, and then Eric's the little brother I never had. Oh, my goodness. Yeah, never had, never wanted. Uh, that's right. Uh, <laughs> unbeknownst to him, he is a great blessing to me when he's not making me mad. I appreciate you, brother. I do. Uh, thankful to have uh, Cindy Lynch on staff with us now. Uh, we're glad that we take in Yankees from New Jersey now. I mean, that shows you we're multicultural over here. <laughs> At Barry's Grove. She's been a real blessing, and her, her love for the Lord and for children's ministry has been uh, endearing, and I appreciate that. We have a lot of fun at staff meetings, in case y'all don't know. We went and ate a lot of food for Lynn's Secretary Day slash birthday the other day at Brooklyn Eats, and it was, we had a lot of fun. Um, I, I certainly want to thank, as has already been mentioned, my wife and daughter, uh, Your family gives up a lot when you're in the ministry. They do. Because we have stuff planned, and then I go, well, I'm sorry. This is going to happen, and there's nothing I can do about that. And then plans get changed. And uh, they've been good. That's all I can say. Thank you all. This year I'll celebrate 30 years of marriage to Tanya. I also add on the five years of dating, that's time served. <laughs> I couldn't be more blessed. I couldn't be more blessed. I talk a lot of junk, it's because we have fun. Uh, and my daughter, she's been a great blessing. Uh, she'll be 24 this year, which means I'm getting really old. That's what that means. But, and then, guess what, Father's Day weekend, I get to help her move, so. <laughs> Yay, Dad. Um, uh, you know, I, I think about, you know, my family growing up. I'm thankful my sister Lisa's here today. Uh, of course, my mom and dad have gone on to be with the Lord, and uh, they had such a huge influence on me. Uh, but, you know, uh, I always give my mom the most credit because, well, you know, I was a mama's boy. I love mama. <laughs> me and dad butted heads a lot. We were both extremely stubborn and opinionated. But uh, I will say... My dad's example paved the way for me to be here 25 years. He was in two churches uh, while I was growing up. He was in one for 11 and the other for 12 and a half. And uh, he was a, an example of commitment and perseverance. And for that, I am grateful to God for blessing me uh, with godly parents. But, you know, finally, I, I, want, to, uh, I want to thank God. Um, and I want to thank them as individual members of the Trinity. Uh, I want to thank Jesus. You know, I was listening to a song on the way here this morning on the radio, and it's called Rescue. It says, when I needed rescue, Jesus, you came through. It's not even one of my favorite songs, but the line caught me this morning because I thought about how would I be here after 25 years if Jesus hadn't rescued me? Because if you'd seen me 30 years ago this month, you would have never thought I'd be a pastor. Thank you, Jesus. And then I want to thank the Father for his sovereignty and how he overrides our plans. Uh, Jeremiah 1. Here's my sermon. <laughs> Jeremiah 1. Tim loves to call me the weeping prophet, Jeremiah. So I thought it would only be appropriate if I read Jeremiah 1 because every time I read it, I think of me. The word of the Lord came to me. I chose you before I formed you in the womb. I set you apart before you were born. I appointed you a prophet to the nations. But I protested, oh no, Lord God, look, I don't know how to speak since I am only a youth. When my mom told me that I should pray about whether God wanted me to go into ministry, my first, res first response was, oh no. And that was Jeremiah's. 
Then the Lord said to me, Do not say, I am only a youth, and you will go, for you will go to everyone I send you to and speak whatever I tell you. Do not be afraid of anyone, for I will be with you to rescue you. This is the Lord's declaration. Then the Lord reached out his hand, touched my mouth, and told me, I have now filled your mouth with my words. And I feel that way. I feel like he touched my mouth and filled it with his words. And that leads me to the last member of the Trinity, the Holy Spirit. And I'm thankful for the continuing, ongoing indwelling of the Holy Spirit that not only enables me to live a life that seeks God's glory, not perfectly, but somewhat consistently, I hope, but that the Holy Spirit also empowers me to speak for him. Because I know one thing. I have nothing worth listening to on my own. And that's why I have always believed that if I got up here and preached you anything but the Bible, you should fire me. I got nothing worth hearing. I can get up and talk to you about Carolina sports. Pick one. I can talk to you about it, right? I can probably talk to you about music. I can talk to you about a lot of things. But none of them are worth hearing. None of them have any lasting value. God's word is the only thing in this world that is eternally valuable. And I am thankful that he's entrusted me with the privilege and the responsibility of preaching God's word to you for the last 25 years. Thank you. So just a reminder to everyone, we will, we will continue this celebration after the service today with the lunch planned in the Family Life Center and a time of sharing. Uh, yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> it might be a roast. I'm not sure what we call it. I'm calling it sharing. There's also a book here that's been circulated through our congregation for people, uh, people that have written special notes, memories, things about Craig, and the book will be available out in the Family Life Center during the time of fellowship that you can sign it, write a note in it if you'd like. It will be available. Um, So, also one more thing. Uh, We have a guest speaker this morning, and Ben Duran has agreed to come and uh, speak with us today. He is our director of the Buell Baptist Association. Did I say that right? Director, is that proper note? What is it? Mission. Strategist. Mission Strategist. I knew I didn't get it right. Okay. (laughs) That's why you make the big bucks. So anyway, that's what he is. And Ben is going to come and deliver our message this morning after our next uh, couple of songs. So please stand and join us as we continue to worship this morning with our theme song of the month, Creator.
swan song brothers <laughs> but this is what I like to hear when we all meet our maker amen
Let's, let's pray together. Father, we thank you for how you have directed our hearts this morning in worship. Father, you have encouraged us to set our minds on that which is above, not on that which is below. And so, Father, in these moments, may the Spirit of God bear witness to the Son of God for the good of the people of God by the Word of God for your glory. Father, strengthen faith where faith is found. And Father, this morning, where there may not be faith, O oh God, would you grant that most precious gift? And would you do so for Jesus' sake, in whose name we pray. Amen. Amen. Well, what an honor. What an honor it is to be here today. What an honor it is to worship with you. Uh, what an honor it is to open God's word on this very special occasion for not only my brother in Christ, but for a dear friend. And it's a blessing uh, to be with you all today. I want to invite you to turn in the Bible this morning to the book of Colossians. Just get your Bible open there to chapter 1. Our primary text will be Colossians 4.17, but I would hope you would uh, just keep it open as a way to help you this morning. <clears throat> I'm sure many of you know this year is an Olympic year. If I'm not mistaken, the Olympics are going to be in Paris, France, I believe. And uh, I kind of chuckled as I read some historical facts about the history of marathon running. Seems like a fitting theme to think about ministering for 25 years. And there was an Olympic runner whose name was John Hayes. He was an American, and he won the gold medal in the marathon in 1908 in London. And uh, he came in first place running those 26 miles. And what I found interesting about John Hayes was his somewhat unorthodox approach to running marathons. When asked about the importance of drinking water, he said he didn't drink water when he ran a marathon. On one occasion, he was reported to have said before a race that he washed his face, face with water from Florida and gargled brandy. <laughs> it's a well-documented fact that runners have rejected John Hayes' approach to marathon running. It is said that on average, men running a 26-mile marathon drink approximately 16 ounces of water to replenish their bodies from the grueling grind of marathon running. And as I've thought about my task this morning, Craig, I cannot help but think of myself as a conduit I trust of living water. I am like a bystander standing alongside the road of the New York City Marathon or the Boston Marathon with a glass or bottle, not of Deer Park water, but of the living water. <laughs> Jesus himself said in John's gospel that if we believed in him, he would satisfy our thirst. And from our very hearts, rivers, not trickles, rivers of living water would flow. And that would be my prayer this morning to you, brother, and to you, to the saints here at Berry's Grove, that uh, this, morning's, this morning's message would encourage us to keep going and to keep, to keep moving. Now, the burden of my heart this morning is a burden that the Apostle Paul shared when he wrote the letter to Colossians. Perhaps you're familiar with this letter, you're familiar with the contours of this letter, the outline of this letter. Paul is deeply concerned about a shifting that is taking place in the church. The church at Colossae was not a place that Paul had built. At this time, Paul is imprisoned for his faith. He has learned of this work that this church has been planted. People have come to faith in Jesus Christ by all appearances. And he has taken up his pen to write a letter to encourage them to continue in the faith. In fact, I would say that an important reason for his writing can be found in verse 23. If you care to look, feel free to in chapter 1. If you don't have a Bible in front of you, simply listen to what he says. He exhorts the church to continue in the faith. Stable and steadfast, not shifting from the hope of the gospel that you heard. 
Paul, of course, continues, I pause there to simply note that that is chief among Paul's concerns. Now, when we think about shifting, we can think of some examples where shifting is actually a good idea. If there are any football fans in here, you want a, sometimes you want, might want a downhill running back or you might want a shifty runner, one who can elude tacklers in hopes of progressing the football team. We might think of the, the blessing of a shift change at the cotton mill or at, at the automotive plant where one group of workers works tire, tirelessly till 3 to 3.30, 4 o'clock, and then there is a shift change where, in theory, people are refreshed and they're able to come in and work as diligently as the first shift. We're familiar with a shift change in a vehicle, in a car. If we want our car to go forward, if we're driving a manual transmission, we want to shift from first to second and second to third. But when we think about matters of faith and hope, we see here in the letter of Colossians that shifting can be most dangerous and most deadly. And thus Paul writes this letter. Paul understands and realizes that the walk of faith is not just a beginning, although it is. April, I don't have the date in front of me, April 1999. But the life of faith is not just a life of starting, but a life of finishing. It's not just a life that begins, it's a life that finishes. And what he wants to impart to us this morning, what the Spirit of God would hope would communicate to you in a powerful way this morning, is the importance of continuing in the faith, not shifting from the hope that you have in Jesus Christ. And we, the people of God, said, Amen. 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 Now, this concern is important for us because this is a perennial concern. This is a concern for all ages. And this is a pressing concern in, our, in the life that I think we find ourselves in in the church in 2024. There has been a book over this last year entitled The De-Churching of America. And in this book, Jim Davis and Michael Graham chronicle what they are calling the great de-churching of America. They have noted over the last 25 years that worship attendance and worship participation has decreased by 40 million Americans. Approximately 40 million Americans over the course of the last 25 years, Americans who used to attend Sunday services at least once a month, now are only attending once a year, if that. This number represents the greatest migration out of the church than any migration into the church combined. So whether it's the historical First Great Awakening of the 18th century or the Second Great Awakening of the 19th century, or all of those who profess living faith during a Billy Graham crusade, all of those numbers combined pale in comparison to the great exodus that we seem to see and experience in the life of the church. Now, how, how do we as God's people respond to, to this bad news? What should disciples of Jesus Christ do in response to the challenge of a shifting hope? Craig, as a pastor of a local church, what should you keep in mind as you live and minister in this context? Well, Scripture contends, and the letter, the letter particularly of Colossians, contends that if God's people, God's people are to flourish, they are to be deeply rooted in the person and work of Jesus Christ. And the church said, Amen. they are to root themselves in the soil of the Savior. They are to be rooted in the rich nutrients of the Savior's soil. If they are not to languish, they will be firmly planted in the Lord Jesus's Lot. And I think this is at the heart of the key admonition in the letter to Colossians. And so if you're looking in chapter 2, I want you to hear the, hear the I think, central admonition or the key admonition in the entire book. That's chapter 2, verses 5 and 6. And the Apostle Paul says, that he says this to the believers. He says, therefore, as you have received Christ Jesus, the Lord, so what are we to do? We are to walk in him, rooted and built up in him, and established in the faith, just as you were taught, abounding in it with thanksgiving. To me, that is the key admonition for us this morning in the entire letter. Everything that comes before it answers the question, why? Why should I receive Christ Jesus? Why should I walk in him? And Paul unpacks that in the first, chap excuse me, in the first chapter. And everything that flows from that admonition answers the question of how or what. How is it that we as the people of God are to walk 
in Christ Jesus. What is it we are to do? And the Apostle Paul, beginning in, in verses 6 and following, all the way to the beginning of chapter 4, walks through that and unpacks that, um, what it means to walk. Now, for our purposes, we don't have time to do that. I mean, I've got time if you've got time. Uh, but I think, I think wisdom would have me do something else. Because I want to make a connection here with, with Craig's ministry as your pastor and the flourishing and the filling that Christ has promised. Because the letter of, this letter of Colossians is about filling. If you take time this afternoon when we finish here after a nap, maybe this evening, if you read through the book of Colossians, you would be, I hope you would marvel at the number of times that Paul mentions the word fullness, fill, or having been filled. The Christian life is a life of being full. And the church said, amen. amen. And if the church is to be full, full of light, full of love, full of hope, it will be because ministers like Craig and like you are carrying out, fulfilling the ministry to which you are called. And with that in mind this morning, I want to direct your attention to Colossians 4, verse 17. One verse, one verse of scripture, one command that the Lord Jesus, the Spirit of God, would have you and I to hear this morning and to, and to begin to tease out what it means to walk in the fullness of Jesus Christ. Now, the command is simple, verse 17. It is a command that comes at the end of the letter. It is a command that comes within the context of Paul, like Craig this morning, giving thanks for men and women who have ministered with him and to him. Very similar in that way. So it feels especially appropriate, just as Craig a moment ago, thank God for Lynn and Eric and Tim and Brother Danny, thanking you for the lay ministry of, of your church. Paul does a very similar thing in verses 7 to 18. He unpacks who's coming to see the Colossians. He shares about the work that has been done. He speaks of Epaphras, their fellow minister, and the work that he has accomplished. And he bears witness to his hard work. And then when he comes to verse 17, he directs a command to one particular person in the, body, in the body of Christ, and his name is Archippus. Verse 17 says this, And say to Archippus, See that you fulfill the ministry that you have received in the Lord. This is God's word, and we said, Amen. Amen. First the command, verse 17, Archippus is exhorted to fulfill his ministry. Brothers and sisters, this is simple. This doesn't require a great deal of, of understanding on our part. Just to speak just as frank and as clear as we can be this morning, finish what you start. Bring to a fitting end what was begun. Fill up what is not quite full. To bring to a close what God has opened for you. We are to take heed to the ministry that God has given us, Craig, because he has taken hold of you, my brother. Paul speaks in two other places about fulfilling the ministry. He tells Timothy in 2 Timothy 4, do the work of an evangelist, or endure hardship, do the work of an evangelist, fulfill your ministry. Same, same idea. There, Paul is exhorting Timothy to complete the range of his redemptive responsibilities. That was his calling. Paul speaks of his own ministry in Acts 20, 24. He says, if only, I, if only I may finish my course and the ministry that I have received. The Apostle Paul had received a ministry. It was a personal ministry like Archippus here. Do you see what the text says or hear what the text says? See that you, Archippus, fulfill the ministry. And I think that's what I want to say to us first. First to you, Craig. Craig, God has given you a personal and particular ministry that he would have you to fill. He hasn't called you to do Lynn's, Lynn's job. And the church said, amen. <laughs> he hasn't called you to be the often impersonated but never duplicated Reverend Tim Bose. <laughs> he has called you to be Craig Willingham a minister, and he has entrusted to you a ministry, and he wants you to receive your personal ministry and to accept it. Now, let me, let me just pause and by way, of, by way of implication this morning. 
I, I want to say to us as church members, I want to say to this, this text, Archippus has a ministry, Craig has a ministry, but I want to say to the body of Christ, by way of reminder, you have a ministry too. Everyone is a minister in the new covenant, and the church said, Amen. everyone who trusts in Christ is Christ's servant. We are under new marching orders. And, and this admonition is not only good for Craig and pastors and preachers and ministers like Craig, but it's good for the entire body of Christ. And so let me say to you, uh, for the church to become what it should be, it will not, it will not, it's not only incumbent that Craig fulfills his ministry, it is incumbent upon you, y'all, that y'all fulfill <laughs> your ministry. And so while it is a personal imperative, it has broad application to the body of Christ. And if you're here this morning and you're not a believer, you're here this morning and have yet to trust in the crucified and risen Savior, let me say on behalf of Jesus this morning, if you've ever been in a situation where a church didn't serve Christ Jesus or a church wasn't passionate about serving or a pastor wasn't passionate about the gospel and serving, let me say on behalf of the kingdom of heaven and every well-meaning ministry and church, we're sorry. We're sorry. Because our Savior did not come to be served. He was not self-seeking. He was not self-serving. He came to offer his life, Mark 10, 45, as a ransom for many. His death on the cross was his final, not his final act of service, but it was his last act before his death as he offered himself this morning. And so as we are mindful this morning of verse 17, we're mindful of a Savior who saved. And I'll, I'll say this parenthetically by way of application. Maybe... Maybe a reason you haven't, can't fulfill your ministry is because you haven't accepted it to begin with. And the reason why you haven't accepted a ministry in the local church is perhaps because you've never accepted the Savior who's called you to ministry, who will equip you to ministry, who will qualify you for ministry. And so we need to hear that this morning. Perhaps the reason why the church is so self-serving from time to time is because we haven't embraced the service and the glory of our Savior. But let me say parenthetically as well to you this morning, receive your ministry. I remember a number of years ago, I was with Brother Tim. Actually, not a number, maybe a year and a half ago, Tim and I were meeting. I came in with uh, my Bible and a, journal, and a journal for a very early morning meeting. My journal was full, and I didn't think twice about it. I had it with me. The very next time Tim and I met, do you know what I had waiting for me? I had a new journal. And the thought I had was, man, that dude is thoughtful. And as thoughtful as he is, his thoughtfulness pales in comparison to the thoughtfulness of God the Father, God the Son, and God the Spirit. And every ministry that you have been called to fulfill, thought and care have been exercised by the Godhead, Godhead in the distribution of the gift and calling that God gave you. Did you hear your pastor a moment ago? There was a ministry that God was calling him to that he didn't want any part of. And I think I can say, in general terms, one of the things that you will find oftentimes, the very thing that God is calling to you to do, your initial response to is going to be, yuck. I don't want to do that. But remember, God of all comforts and the Father of all mercies comforts us in our affliction. He comforts us in our pain. He comforts us in our deepest hurts. Because it is in the very spot of our deepest weaknesses, our deepest hurts, our deepest hardships that God equips us, strengthens us, empowers us to be ministers. Right. Do you hear that this morning? Maybe God is calling you to a ministry that you don't want any part of. Maybe it's a ministry of evangelism. Maybe it's a ministry of low service. Do you hear, do you hear the admonition to Archippus this morning? Will you receive it this morning? See that you either receive for the first time or complete what God has called you to do, this ministry. See that you fulfill this ministry because it is, it is personal. Now, because it is personal, there are, there are several, I think, important implications for us to consider this morning. Craig, you're not only saved by grace, but you serve by grace. And as we celebrate these 25 years, we can affirm that God gifted you with salvation and has gifted you for service. God has not only given you the gift of his son, he has given you a gift from his spirit. And this gift is not just given to you, it is given to the body of Christ. Ephesians 2.10 doesn't say that pastors are God's workmanship. It doesn't say that just deacons are God's workmanship. It doesn't just say that men or women are God's workmanship. The text says what, friends? Ephesians 2.10. 
We, you all, the body of Christ are his workmanship. And so with that in mind, as a ministry received, Craig, consider the following. Be content with the gift God gave you. Craig, it's probably true you have more vocational ministry behind you than you do in front of you. And if ministry is a race that you run, you may not be in the home stretch yet, but you may be able to see it if, you're, if you don't need a new upgraded prescribed glasses. <laughs> and I feel like in saying that it, and I feel confident in saying that if you spend the rest of your ministry envying other ministers' gifts, you will not fulfill your own. We have been called to be earnest, not envious. And it occurs to me that one of the besetting sins of older men and older ministers is the regret they sometimes live with. And that bitterness portrays itself in expressions of bitterness and envy towards ministers, especially younger ministers. Brother, don't pastor or preach from a position of envy. Paul said there were people who, men who preached the gospel in, in Rome who preached not from love, but from envy. They ministered out of a heart of jealousy and conceit. Remember, Craig, that love doesn't envy. 1 Corinthians 13. Remember the wisdom of Proverbs that a tranquil heart gives life to the flesh, but envy causes the bones to rot. Why is there a great de-churching in America? Why hundreds of churches every year close their doors? Could it not be that the superstructure of the body of Christ is riddled with jealousy and envy? And ministry is not done from a heart of love. Ministry is done out of rivalry and family. Brother Craig, think King Saul and David. Saul could not rejoice in David's accomplishments because they outshone his own. He could not say, I must decrease and David must increase. Brother, fulfill your ministry by not being envious of younger ministers, but by being an encouragement. Brother, be a Moses to a Joshua be a David to a Solomon, be an Elijah to an Elisha, be a Paul to a Timothy. And as you pass the baton of ministry with earnestness and encouragement, I'm convinced you will fulfill what God has called you to do. Church family, be thankful for the gifts in the body of Christ. Sometimes at church we can act like spoiled brats at Christmas. You ever, you ever been in a situation where grandmother stands up before the gifts are open and says, now I just want all the grandchildren to know your grandfather and I love you very much and as a token of our love we're giving you these special gifts at Christmas now please don't think that we love you less if you have two gifts and another one has three gifts don't think that we love you more if you have three and your cousin just has one there needs to be more encouragement and contentment in the body of Christ yes. can you rejoice can you rejoice at other people's happiness in the body of Christ can you rejoice when someone does something well in the body of Christ when you see a weakness in the body of Christ, can you come along them, can you come beside them discreetly and help them as, as, as opposed to exposing them? Well, they didn't show up for their nursery shift like they were supposed to. <laughs> we need to remember in the body of Christ the gift we have received for ministry is a gift that is packed with God's wisdom and love. Therefore, we don't have to feel insecure in the body of Christ. Because we don't have our cousin's teaching gifts. We don't have to be envious of our brother or sister's ministry. Because the spirit of your father has distributed and divided our gifts and ministry. It is a ministry that is received. Finally, I want just to highlight something else. It is a ministry, it is a ministry that has been revealed. Now, that's not clear from verse 17. 17 says, see that you fulfill the ministry that you have received in the Lord. But if you turn back with me to chapter 1, we see that Paul thinks of himself like Archippus. In chapter, in chapter 1, verse 23, at the bottom, Paul says of the gospel, because of the gospel, because of the good news of a crucified and risen Savior, I have become a minister. This is the word translated deacon. And so Paul isn't confused about who he is. He understands he's an apostle of Jesus Christ. He has begun the letter in chapter 1, verse 1, Paul, an apostle. But he understands his apostolic ministry as a ministry of service. And therefore, he can say here in this verse, of which I, Paul, became a minister. He speaks of this ministry two occasions. Once in chapter 1, verse 
23 and again in verse 25. And between those two bookends of ministry is a profound truth, and that is the privilege of ministry is a mystery that has been revealed. The new covenant, the new covenant ministry, the service that God has called the body of Christ to, is a ministry that is swept up in the mystery of Jesus Christ. Now, when we hear the term mystery, we want to cue the Scooby-Doo music. But a mystery in the Bible is not a problem. It's not a riddle to be solved. It is a wholly hidden truth that God has kept hidden for a long time. In, in this text, verse 25, it says he has kept this truth hidden for ages and generations. In other words, a long time has passed, and I call it a holy hiddenness simply because we're so used to people when they hide things from us, they have ulterior motives. People hide things from us because they don't want us to know a fact or they want to hurt us or they want to harm us. But God's hiddenness is rooted in his holiness. It's rooted in the good of his people. And so the Apostle Paul just says here, he says, the mystery has been revealed. And Craig, because you are a minister of the mystery, I want to exhort you in just a couple of basic ways. Number one, in your teaching and preaching, don't speak mysteriously. Speak plainly, brother. That's Paul's understanding and calling. So he says, he says here in these verses of verse 25, he says, I'm a steward of, I'm a, a minister according to the stewardship from God. This was given to me, he says, what was given to him, or why was it given, the end of verse 25, to make the word of God fully known. Paul was a plain speaker. He, this is important to him in the life of the church because he understands the plainer he is, the clearer he is, the more help the people of God are in embracing the person and work of Jesus Christ. And so Paul prays in chapter 4. You don't have to turn over, but just listen to what he prays in chapter 4. He says, listen, pray for me to declare, this is chapter 4, verse, um, verse 4, verse 3 and 4. Pray for me for the word to declare the mystery of Christ on account of which I am in prison, that I may make it clear which is how I ought to speak. Brother, there is a way that you and I ought to speak the unsearchable riches of Jesus Christ. We are to speak them clearly. We are to speak them confidently. We are to speak them persuasively. We are to speak them with the help of the Holy Spirit powerfully. Why? Because these truths, this, these hidden truths are life-changing Church, what do we say to that? Amen. Amen. These are life-altering, life-changing truths. That Jesus Christ in his nature, truly God and truly man. What a mystery. What a profound reality. That Jesus Christ was before the beginning. Colossians 1.15. That Jesus Christ is head of the church. The firstborn, the Bible says, from the dead. So, brother, preach clearly, preach confidently. Brother, struggle, struggle faithfully. Struggle and suffer joyfully. Look what Paul says in verse 24. Now I rejoice in my sufferings for your sake. Isn't that beautiful? That is so cool. It's interesting here. Paul doesn't say he's a minister of the church. In verse 23 and verse 25, he says he's a minister of the gospel. But his ministry of the gospel is for on behalf of who? It's on behalf of the church. That's an important distinction to make. Because there will come a time when Craig will no longer be the pastor of Barry's Grove Baptist Church, but he will always be what? He will also be always be a minister of Christ's gospel. And Paul says here in verse 24, he says, I, I rejoice in my sufferings. I find joy in them. He doesn't find joy in the suffering for the suffering's sake. He finds joy in the suffering for what, is, for what it is accomplishing. It is for the sake of his body that is the church of which I became a minister. Brother, I don't know what the future holds. 
But it, if you are going to be a faithful minister, you are going to face suffering, whether it is emotional, financial, physical, I don't know. And it seems to me that one of the things that we must ready ourselves to do is to be willing to receive the fire, as it were, because we understand that we've been called to be a faithful minister. It isn't enough just to speak. God hasn't called us just to speak. He's called us to live. And he's called us not just to endure suffering. In some sense, he's inviting us, as Paul here says in verse 24, to rejoice in it. So that would be my prayer for you. Church, I pray that you would pray in that way as well. That as the word of Christ dwells in your heart, that you would pray for your fellow, for your pastors, praying for Eric and praying for Craig, that they would not only speak the word clearly, but when they do speak the word clearly, that they would be able to rejoice in the hardship that comes from declaring the unsearchable riches of Christ. And thirdly, Brother Craig, as we think about this mystery, I want to exhort you to labor, labor in the ministry of prayer. Here Paul says, he's faithful in prayer. In chapter 1, we, we, hear, we actually hear Paul's prayer in verses 9 to 14. But then we have a record of, of another praying minister in Ephesians, um, excuse me, in Colossians 4 with Epaphras in verse 12. Epaphras, who is one of you, a servant of Christ Jesus, he greets you, always agonizing, here is, is, could be rendered that way, always agonizing on your behalf in his prayers that you may stand mature and fully assured in all the will of God. What a, what a beautiful admonition, a beautiful testimony. Can anyone in your life bear witness to that reality? Is there a co-worker, co-laborer? That brother not only prays, that brother labors in prayer. He labors on behalf of God's people. Can that be said of us, the church? The church is called to pray. Look at Colossians 4, verse 2. Continue steadfastly in prayer. Another translation says, devote yourselves to prayer, being watchful in it with thanksgiving. Faith family, the chief expression, one, one writer has said that the chief expression of faith is prayer. Will you commit to continue to devote yourselves to prayer? Thank you. I want to thank Barry's Grove for your example in prayer. We had a 40-day 40 days, 40 day prayer emphasis, and you were noticeably there. Uh, at both meetings that we had for the body of Christ. We don't need less of that. We need more of that. And I pray that, that we'll do that in light of the ministry that God has so graciously given to us. And say to Archippus, see that you fulfill the ministry that you have received in the Lord. Let's pray together. Father, I thank you this morning for the riches of your truth. I thank you, Father, for Jesus Christ, the Son of God. I thank you for his death on the cross, and I thank you, Father, that you raised him from the dead. If anyone is here today who doesn't know Jesus Christ as their Savior and Lord, Father, I pray that they would turn, that their minds and hearts would turn away from, from death and darkness to the light and love of Jesus. Father, we thank you today for Craig's 25 years of service. We thank you for the many years of faithful service of the saints here at Berries Grove Baptist Church. Father, we fall, we fall short in ministry. We fail you in ministry. But we thank you that your grace is sufficient not only to forgive us for our failures, but to equip and strengthen us for a ministry future. Father, however long that ministry lasts on earth, help us, Lord, to be found faithful. So that when that day comes, when we stand before your throne of grace, Father, we too might hear those blessed words, well done, thou good and faithful servant. Father, until that day, may we be found faithful. In Jesus we pray. Amen. Please stand and join us. Amazing grace. <laughs>
going on today, you may have heard mentioned, to uh, celebrate our pastor, and Brother Bose will be speaking over there. Um, you don't want to miss what he has to say, I'm sure. I'm hoping nobody spits out any drink while he's talking. I mean, I, I expect to get a few laughs from what he's going to share. Um, I don't know what he's going to share. I have no idea. I hadn't talked to him about this, but, but those are my expectations. Um, so please come to, uh, to lunch. And the uh, rest of this week, regular prayer meeting on Wednesday night. We do have Youth Dinner and a Movie starting this Wednesday, if that pertains to you. And uh, next week, we've celebrated our pastor day. Next week, we're celebrating our graduates and our fathers. Um, please come out and, and support them and uh, be here for worship next week as well. And we still need some VBS workers. Please talk to Cindy if you're able to help out with that. Um, at this time, we're going to do something a little bit different today with most of our lunches, and we're going to try to make Craig go first. So, as we are uh, honoring him today, so I'm going to ask uh, Tanya and Caroline to come down so they can go out to lunch with him, and I'm going to get up out of the way because there's too many people down here. <laughs> and... Uh, since Tim is speaking, we want him to be able to eat quickly and eat first, so I'm going to ask Tim and his family to come on as well, Care and Katie and Rachel. <laughs> Tim, I, I honestly expected you to do a collage of all those headshots that you had. I, I requested one from the back view of his head, but I didn't get it. <laughs> We were thinking the same thing. And, uh, and as our guest, I'm going to ask Ben and his family um, if they would accompany them out for, for lunch as well to be at the front of our line. Ben, Betsy, AJ, and three JDs. John, Jesse, Josh. John, Jesse, Josh. I know them all. <laughs> so I'm going to uh, ask a blessing and then... All of these are going to head out. Do not speak to them now. <laughs> Let them get out there and get their food. You can speak to, to them during and after um, lunch. So, um, so I'm going to pray. You head out. Don't speak to anybody. Okay. Right. I know how it goes. I've been in that position. Well, I'll get by door, Thank you. Good. All right. Let's pray. Father God, we just want to thank you so much for this uh, wonderful, blessed morning as we Lord, worship you, and Lord, as we celebrate your faithful servant. Uh, Lord, we thank you so much for this service. Uh, Lord, I thank you for all these uh, friends and, and family. Lord, this wonderful church family that we have to be able to support our pastor. And Lord, we thank you for blessing us with such a wonderful pastor. Uh, Lord, we do pray your blessing upon this time of fellowship that we're about to enjoy. Lord, we pray your blessing upon the food that's been pre prepared, provided, and, Lord, all the uh, arrangements that were made to make this possible. Lord, we thank you for all of that. And, Lord, we just pray your blessings on the rest of our time. And it's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. Amen. God is good. All the time. All the time. God is good.